tell us about how you came to spirituality. Were you raised in a believing home? Yes, I was raised in a very uh, Catholic believing home in a village in West Germany. And uh, it was, uh, there was a deep belief and there was a, a, a rituals about Mother Mary. We used to pray the rosary and all and we would set up the altar in the whole month of May. There was sitting together as a family and praying and decorating and all. So that was my background. But then also I must say, already as a very young child, I had a very deep link with nature. I felt one with nature, with the fields, with the flowers, with the trees and the river. There was unity with it, which I fell out coming into school. Where I was told that a child which goes to school doesn't talk to, to fish and to the bird anymore. The rational impact came in. And then later on, when I was 14, I um, lost my grandfather. And along with it, the deep belief, my belief was so, so strong that I was convinced that I wanted to become a missionary doctor in India or in Africa. And that all fell apart with the age of 14. Yeah. So um, how did that fall apart? I was this, my whole notion what life is about and what God, God is about was that um, there is a caring God, there is a loving God and he will not do great harm. He will not allow that anything happens to me. And since I was very, uh, very deeply linked with my grandfather, the way he died and all I was so frustrated, I was so shocked, I felt that there, there can't be a, do, a, a, a God who is so uncaring. And I made God re responsible for all the misery in the world. And I ch just chucked him out of my life. Wait, how did your grandfather die? Uh, well, I mean, he... Uh, was, uh, in spite of that, he was in the neighboring village and I, I was supposed to uh, look after him. And I mean, he was more or less okay, but he, he died in one night and it took about three days till he was found. And it was really shocking for us. And of course, there was a lot of guilt of not having look, looked after him. And it, it took quite some, some, t some time to separate that guilt and that sort of notion of making God responsible for everything. Yeah. So you chuck him out at 14, um, which sounds like something we do as 14 year olds. I'm going to make a complete change. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of going to walk away from things that I grew up, grew up with. Um, I only say that because at 14, I joined the Mormon church and for my family that was really like upsetting and it felt like I was walking away from them in a way. Um, so I feel like at 14, we, we make these changes, right? Um, yeah. And then we look backwards and we say, Oh, <laughs> I accomplished some things I wanted to accomplish, but maybe, maybe that wasn't the, the, the wisest way I did it or something like that. I don't know how you feel about that. Um, so how did you come back to spirituality? How did you come back to the divine? Uh, well, after life uh, took me to India, I was very really enchanted by the way religion, spirituality was openly lived. I mean, I would be sitting on my rooftop and I would hear people chanting, people singing, people lighting their incense. I was surrounded by it. And then I was working in a school, and that was a, a school with a spiritual background. It was part of the Sri Aurobindo Ashram. And there every morning started with prayers, every morning started with meditation and all. And slowly it was seeping in that there was a deep longing for that connection, for that unity, which I had, had as a child. And I felt like I was thrown out of paradise with that decision which I'd made myself. And something in me was longing to get back to that somehow. Of course, it took some time to just 
remove all the pain to look at all that, what drove me away from it. That had to be cleared out gradually and slowly I open up. I open up, I started reading the scriptures, I started, of course, I mean, I must say I'd studied uh, social anthropology and indology, so it was part of the, uh, the curriculum. But the curriculum, one was, uh, one was reading it, one was studying it, but it had nothing to do with one's personal life. That's at least I saw most of the other students treating it. It wasn't something that was seeping deeply into, into every grain of your system. So um, gradually it was opening up and I was, uh, I rediscovered yoga, which I had already as a 14 year old in Germany, my first course. So that also helped a lot and it had then suddenly a very different meaning. So opening up slowly, step by step, to all these systems, these ways, these visions, these realizations, which, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, I was going to ask, um, as you had children, did you find uh, becoming a mother, becoming a parent, did that in any way impact um, your spiritual life? Oh, Yes. It impacted very much because um, I suddenly had to decide what I wanted to uh, reflect to my children. What sort of belief system? That was one thing and I decided to keep it very open. So I would suddenly find myself celebrating all the Catholic, all the Christian uh, festivities and with all the stories, with all the background, that suddenly came alive again. And I was giving that to, exposing my children to this. And then the other thing is, um, my son, when he was three years old, he kept talking about his past lives. And that was surely, and in the school I was teaching, I was um, encountered a number of three years old who remembered their past life. And for me, it was that time just the belief system. I felt I didn't give, uh, I felt it's just stuff which kids talk, but it wasn't like that. And then, of course, um, along with that, I would slide into, into uh, past life experiences going somewhere. And suddenly a whole life would unfold in front of me. So that was setting into motion as well. That's really interesting. I don't think I knew that. Um, what was that experience the first time? How did that happen, that you would have a past life unfolded for you? Um, I was um, accompanying my husband with a group of students into Vrindavan. Uh, Vrindavan is an old uh, Krishna place. And um, we were walking down the street and suddenly a door opened. And a stream of widows walked out, all dressed in white. And I stood there, I froze. And I looked into the eyes of one of them, and suddenly a whole past life sequence was unfolding. And I don't know for how long I stood there, but the widows had gone, the group of students had also gone with my husband, and I felt completely lost and shaken up. Because this was something I couldn't deal with. This was uh, stuff which I didn't believe in and I'd never experienced before. And it just blew my mind. And then afterwards, I kept falling into that existence in dreams or I would wake up or I would just stand somewhere and suddenly another flashback of that came. And after the f that first one, several would come. I would walk into uh, Old Delhi and suddenly I knew exactly what's around the corner in an area where I've never been. I knew there's this house and there's this and that, and I would get frightened and go back. And so I can't deal with this. This is too much. A sort of mental frame, that logical frame that holds us just blue completely. So what helped you reconcile those visions with, with a new frame? It took a while. 
I remember the kids who were talking so playfully about it. And I started realizing there must be something. If a three-year-old can so playfully talk about it as it would be the most normal thing, and not just one, several one. Then I became, I started studying it. And I noted it down what these three-year-olds had to say. And I found it suddenly something which is actually something which is real, something which is true. And it's not just the fact that I was maybe too long under the Indian sun. It's something which, which is something that I can integrate into myself and open up to it and see what happens. And a lot of whiteness came in. I suddenly would walk into, into um, old buildings, palaces and all, and I could start going backwards and forwards in time. Because there was that mental tight frame had opened up. And I could, with a little effort, just experience how it must have been 300 years ago in that place, what was happening. So what did this... What does this knowledge help you understand about our connection to the divine? Or does it? I would think it would. But you tell me. Well, it it gave me that realization that I surely have been in India before. I surely have been in different religions before. I've been in practicing Hindu before. I've been in practicing Muslim before. And it all, at the base of it, had a common connection. The essence was the same. So there's this idea that you, all of us have continued on, like we have an eternity behind us and we have an eternity before us? Is that sort of what you took away from it? Yes. Yes, surely we do. Okay. I think I think this is such important um, context for, for your accident and what you experienced uh, after the accident and um, because you sort of, you had this foundation already, a, a way of thinking about yourself, right? And thinking about your place in the universe. Um, so that when the accident happens, um, and you have this miraculous experience, right? Um, you were open to it, you were ready, you were sort of prepared for it, I guess. Is it, would that be? Would that be a way to think of it? Surely it was. And I must add also that the night before the accident, I was sitting at the seaside. I was at a, crossway, a crossroad and I was calling out to the universe to give me a sign. What is the right way? And then I was in agonizing pain and wondering what this was all about and almost sliding into my victim, victim role that life is there to crush me down and I suddenly remembered this was the answer from the universe. And of course, that was one. And the fact that I was riding on this very busy highway in South India, and I was suddenly hit. And I was blown off from my three-wheeler and was shooting up into the air. and. I was landing not on the road, on the busy highway. I was landing in the Divine Mother's lap, being enveloped, being cherished, being filled, being flooded. Every fiber, every muscle, every organ was just flooded with this incredible love which I had never experienced before. And I have the feeling that without these experiences before, my mindset might have been different. I might have just shut out things and 
got into fear and panic and whatever and couldn't open up to that. Yeah. So it was, that background is important. I mean, it all happens in a context and in a state one, one is at that moment of one, one's life. So could you set up for us um, more explicitly the accident? We know you're on a highway. We know you're riding on a three-wheeler. Um, but where are you? Who are you with? Um, what were you, where were you headed? Um, well, I was heading from Oroville in South India back to Pondicherry. And I was with my, with my uh, son and um, his girlfriend, and they were, the three of us were on a scooter, on a three-wheeler, and um, it was getting dark, and we were crossing, I was, I was leading ahead, and my son was falling on the second scooter, and um, we were, cross I mean, in fact, I was, I was crossing the highway, crossing the busy highway as I crossed in Delhi, the, the, the busy roads before. And uh, when I just crossed and I, I was uh, moving on in line with the traffic, I was hit by this motorbike. So, uh, okay. it... Uh, was something which, which had an incredible setting because it was just, it was just the time in the, when the sun was going down and in India that goes very really fast and everyone was switching on their light, almost like setting the stage for a miracle to unfold. And in, in that sort of setting, the, this, this whole uh, accident took place. And so you get hit by the motorbike, you get thrown into the air, and then as you say, when you land, you don't land on the road, you land in the lap of the Divine Mother. Um, for you, how long did it feel like you stayed there in that experience of incredible love and um, being enveloped by the Divine? Eternity. I was out of the frame of, of time and space. It was as I was coming home. I was finally reaching home. And then to wake up, not in the lap of the Divine Mother, what was that like? That was agony because my uh, son, who had meanwhile shifted me into a three-wheeler to take me to the hospital. He was calling out. He call, was calling out with such intensity for me to wake up and open my eyes. And I heard the sound, I heard his voice, but I was trying to shut it off because I did, did not want to lose that connection. I didn't want to be thrown out of paradise. And so when I opened up my eyes, and in fact, I mean, I could I open up my eyes, but I could not see him. I could hear him. I was severely hit. I had severe, severe head injuries. I'd broken my neck. And I knew that there was something with my neck, and I could barely speak, but I gathered all my strength to tell him, that the scooter fellow has to slow down because they were rushing to the hospital and I, I was on these bumpy roads. I was, my neck was shaken and um, my son was, was holding me then tighter and his whole shirt and everything. I was bleeding profusely, profusely and um, I, the, Pain was so severe that I was very tempted to pass out and go back. But there was this voice which was telling me clearly, 
not to leave the body, to stay with the body and not run away from it. And whenever, I mean, the, the, the ride to the hospital seemed to be very long and I was kept being tempted to pass out again. And every time I was tempted, the voice came in and said, you need to stay with the body. If you are not staying with the body, you're going to lose it. So this carried on even after I'd been to the hospital and they were starting to figure out what happened and all. And I kept asking the doctors, okay, have you figured it out? Can I, can I pass out now a while? I can't take the pain anymore. I can't take it more. I can't take it more. And they said, yes, yes, you go to sleep. But the voice would come and say, do not leave the body. Stay with the body. Go deeper. Go deeper. And there already my first lesson came. Because I was, um, I could just, I mean, I learned that from my meditation, I could just be out, out there, up in the cloud, and run away from the office, uh, office I'm saying, <laughs> from the body, distracting myself. But it said very clearly, go deeper. You need to go deeper into the body. And that I had not learned by then, how to go deeper and deeper and deeper to find a place where it was bearable, bearable to be. Yeah, that's interesting. You're in all of this pain and your body's been heavily traumatized. So it might be really frightening to be told, stay with the body, go deeper into the body. But it sounds like what you're saying is you went deeper into the body and found the, and found a place of rest. Is that right? I found a place of rest. It took a long time because it didn't work to begin with. Uh, it, I mean, it was a long stretch. It was not only to begin with. I mean, it took two days till I had my operation of the neck and I had to fit a plate and take bone mass from, from the hip to, to fit the chipped vertebras. And I mean, it was it was a very lengthy and and very dangerous operation. And so this agony, the pains were even afterwards there. And it took me some time to learn how to go even deeper and even deeper. That and I mean, find that place of rest, or even go deeper into that dark chamber, which I later on called the dark chamber of the Divine Mother, the womb, the dark womb of the, of the Divine Mother, where one comes very close to death. It appears to me that is the sort of final sort of um, landing place where we all reach in the end. So in America, we have a fascination with near-death experiences. Um, and often when people talk about them, not necessarily in the books that are written or, but often we concentrate on, you know, I had this experience that, you know, traumatized my body. And then I I went and I saw and I experienced something. We don't often focus on or pay attention to the recovery, the long, long recovery. And from what I understand you had to heal, you had to learn how to walk again, you had to learn how to use your hands again, you had to learn, you had to build all the strength back up into your body. Uh, this was an incredibly long process. So, um, and when I met you, when I met you, how long had, had how long before had been the accident? Well, the accident was the uh, end of 2013. Okay, and I met you in 2019. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and even then, I remember you, um, I remember having this moment with you where I was trying to open a bag and I wanted some scissors to open a bag from the store with food in it. And you were like, no, you have to open it with your bare hands. You have to keep your strength. You have to build your strength. And that's, I think, the <laughs> first time you actually mentioned your accident to me um, because I was trying to get the easy way out with the scissors. Um, but 
uh, yeah. So even then, six years later, you were still like consciously thinking about your recovery. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this recovery, um, what it meant for you, and uh, again, how it helped you understand those experiences right after the accident. Uh, well, as you said, it was a long, drawn process. And it was, it was basically, it, it was a pilgrimage. It was a pilgrimage within. It was a pilgrimage to find the core, to find the healer within. And in connection with that, there was always... Um, a sort of calling out for help because in the heal in the healing process there was often there was a, one hit the bottom and it was just things were not moving anymore and it didn't look like I would be able to get out of the wheelchair. It didn't look like I would be able to walk again or something. And in that sort of process of developing the the capacity to surrender brought in a very different dimension. Because before, I was always onto that sort of uh, framework of either or. Suddenly there was this thing of the need of surrendering and being accepting what happened. If this is the way I'm going to be, if, if I'm going to live my life in a wheelchair, it is okay. I surrender to it, I accept it, I'll deal with it. I'll be okay with it. But at the same time, keeping that faith alive, calling out for the grace, calling out and seeing in a visualizing that I would be able to dance again, that I would be able to climb mountains again, to swim again. Having that capacity at the same time in that process of surrender. Because before it was, if I surrender, that means I'm sitting back and I trust God will do everything. And if it doesn't happen, then it's, uh, yes, it's his, his will. This whole different dimension was coming in. And it was falling through in the entire uh, sequence of what w was happening. And in this sort of calling out and surrendering, there would be suddenly a new aspect coming in, a healer walking in, uh, who would help me to heal the trauma out of the body, to heal all these restrictions which had come into the body and the body would not open up, would not open up the, the hand, would not open up the capacity to stand on the legs because in the body something had to be healed and released and to act be activated. So the whole relationship with the body changed. The relationship with uh, the healing process and what it all means. That's really interesting. Um, I think in America, we have these ideas about being warriors that are, <laughs> I don't know, there's always this soldier war imagery in America and listening to you talk about surrender, but also talk about uh, pushing forward and, and working. Um, it sort of flies in the flame. It flies into the face of our cultural ideas about how you triumph, um, and I appreciate that. I appreciate what you're talking about. I also have a question about well, you know. Let oh, let me say something on this because I have that very much ingrained into my German system. <laughs> okay. Because I've been into a, into sports, into competitions as a 
15, 16, 17 year old, I was completely into sport and winning and all and, and going, pushing the body, pushing the body over the limits. When I was trying to do this with my body, it would break and it would backfire completely. I had to change the attitude in which I was dealing with my body. I had to love my body in spite of hating it for being so miserable, so being uh, so in, incapable. I had to deal, the fa deal with the fact what it means to be an invalid, to be somebody who cannot uh, live out of the strength of that body anymore. I had to deal with my body as a small child who responds and I have to listen and I have to go the body's way, not my fixed idea of pushing through things in the fastest way possible. My whole way of relating to the body had to change. I had to start loving the body. It actually reminds me about learning another language and um, and you speak many. Um, so this... This, uh, I don't know if you're going to relate to this experience, but uh, for a while I lived in France and I spoke French and my French was such that, and I was really proud of my French at this point. I was really proud about this ability of, I don't know the word for what I need to say, but I can describe all the things around the word. <laughs> and then hopefully I get to, I get to comprehension and I get to communication with another person. Um, and sort of the relief and joy with, uh, being able to do that in, and sort of, anyway, it just reminds me of that process. Like you're talking about your body, you want to go in a straight line and your body's like, well, we're going to go over and we're going to take a rest here <laughs> and then we're going to go and take a rest over there and then we'll eventually get to where we need to go, but it's not going to be the straight line, um. And so accepting that as, as progress and accepting that as, um, yeah, accepting Not that Not only as... accepting this, but having a sincere commitment towards the body. I had to stand up and fight for it. I had to tell the doctor, this is not going to work for me. My body will not, is not willing to take this. I would have to tell the physiotherapist what my body wanted and what my my way of the body is of healing. I had to go on a different path, which I didn't know. I just had to listen very carefully and be in tune with the body, being very, very close, not being in my mind and spinning around, but being with the body in that moment, sensing the body and perceiving what the body had to say to that. And that way, I mean, the body tells its own truth. The body doesn't lie. And there I was with my sort of uh, um, over, um, what do you say, um, overconfidence into doctors and doctor, what the doctors say is like the Bible. I had to come away from it and I had to trust my body more than anybody else. Yeah. And talk to my body, talk to these different parts, because they all had something to say. I had to tune into it and be available to what it said, even if it was incredible and didn't make sense at that moment. So can we talk a little bit about the people around you during this process? Um, I think of you as this really capable person um, I'm sure you were really capable before the accident, and then you're put into this position, you said earlier, of being an invalid. Um, how did that change your relationships with the people around you? And also, how did that, did you learn anything about your relationship to the divine through that experience? Well, first of all, the relationship with people around me uh, was uh, so caring, so I was so much looked after. Everybody was right there to be with me and 
I would, was looked after day and night. There was my son, my daughter, my husband who went out of their way to just be with me and uh, help me to go through this phase because it was un unpredictable. I mean, I would be able to wake up and be in such agony because I wouldn't have slept the whole night because of the pain. And my son would come in with a beautiful piece of music and play to me. He would just look at me and he knew exactly what I'd gone through the, the night before and lift me out of, of this agony stage with a beautiful piece of music where I suddenly realized, and even if I can't dance anymore, my whole body is dancing. My fingers, my cells, everything is dancing. So I had the the most beautiful care around me. My sister would fly in from Germany to be with me and look after me, to pitch in. So this is, was an amazing ex experience, being held by these loved ones around me. And then, of course, over and over the notion that I'm held, I'm guided, I am loved by a love which is greater than I could ever imagine. And everything, all I had to do was just open up to that and dive in deeper and deeper in it and allow that process to happen, to allow that healing and that loving taking place. <laughs>